Testing, testing. All right, and here we go. <sighs> cool. Hey, guys. How are you all going this evening? Okay, or this morning or whatever time it happens to be in your part of the world. I hope um, everything's going all right. Hello from overcast and chilly lockdown land, Melbourne. I'm looking for my glasses. They're in my lap. So... Last night we started Rule 1, uh, do not carelessly denigrate uh, institutions or creative endeavours, I think, uh, creative achievement. Um, and of course, that was headed up by the image of the fool in the tarot cards. And so we are up to the subheading... What should we point to? Um, we So we finished up, um, not last night, um, that was my night off, Friday night, where he was um, talking about how he'd been observing one of his young, um, but, you know, infant family members as she, uh, you know, grew awareness and how she had learnt to point and how that had, uh, you know, you, she could, you, he could witness he was witnessing her kind of come to this awareness that, that there was power uh behind this thing of pointing of um of naming in particular the thing that you want uh, you know to be moved in the world uh and then and he kind of extrapolated out from that that it's um a bit of a fundamental uh it's a, it's, a, it's it's one of the fundamental kind of underpinnings of language it, uh, that we that we name things so that we um uh or here I'll say it in his words the mere fact of naming something and of course everybody agreeing on the name is an important part of the process whereby the infinitely complex world of phenomena and fact is reduced to the functional world of value. So something that we can use and we, we can all use kind of together equally uh, it, because reality is kind of big and infinite and, and we can't, you know, hard for us to kind of get a grip on. And it's continual interaction with social institutions that makes this reduction, this specification possible. And I guess his argument is that, uh, you know, the, it's the institutions that distill uh the fundaments of uh the things that society places meaning and value on i guess all right so uh subheading what should we point to the social world narrows and specifies the world for us marking out what is important but what does important mean how is it determined the individual is moulded by the social world, but social institutions are moulded too, yeah, by the requirements of the individuals who compose them. Well, they're supposed to in their, in their properly functioning, non-corrupt form. Arrangements must be made for our provisioning with the basic requirements of life, yeah? We cannot live without food, water, clean air and shelter. If um, anything that uh, Geordie says prompts an idea or a thought in your head, please feel free to comment on it or discuss things within yourself in the chat or whatever. Uh, you know, don't think that you, um, that you can't, uh, you know, that you've got to just, uh, you know, totally listen to what I'm saying. Um, but yeah, I'm interested in what other people have got to think about what Geordie thinks as well, as well as what I have to think about what Geordie thinks. Uh, so yeah, we cannot live without food, water, clean air and shelter. Less self-evidently, we require companionship, play, touch and intimacy. These are all biological as well as psychological necessities. And this is no, by no means a comprehensive list. We must signify and then utilise those elements of the world capable of providing us with those requirements. Okay, so we must signify, as in we must point to them, name them, give them form, um, and then utilise, as in put to proper efficient use, those elements of the world capable of providing us with those secondary requirements. And the fact that we're deeply social adds another set of constraints to the situation. Excuse me. We must perceive and act in a manner that meets our biological and psychological needs, but 
since none of us lives or can live in isolation, we must meet them in a manner approved of by others. And yeah, that does sound, you know, if, you, if you're a kind of natural rebel, you know, the, the saying it like that kind of might make it great on you. Um, but in its essence, really, that's what it is. It, like society really is agreed upon, a set of agreed upon social behaviours that um, we've all decided to find acceptable and beyond which um, we've agreed that that is unacceptable in, ter- in terms of behaviour. And I guess in an ideal world, the behaviours that we would agree upon as being functional and, and therefore good and valuable they would be the ones that enabled the most, you know, all of us, you know, rather than, you know, just some of us or one of us or et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, in my idea anyway, a healthy society would be made up of people that <clears throat> aren't necess- excuse me, aren't necessarily, they're individualistic and freely individual, but aren't necessarily of the mind that they they can take more than anybody else deserves you know that everybody else has has um that no yeah you know what I mean equality <laughs> it's quite simple um that's you know so I would like to see a society where where we value you know where where the art the architecture the framework of society kind of supports that kind of underpinning that kind of principle uh so where are we um excuse me uh so yeah we must perceive and act in a manner so the solutions we apply to our fundamental um biological problems must also be acceptable and implementable socially there isn't really any point having pie in the sky ideals if humans aren't capable of living up to them we have to be intensely realistic at the same time very what's the word not shutting not shutting anything down high expectations yeah but at, but also intensely realistic for our solutions for the world It's worth considering more deeply just how necessity limits the universe of viable solutions and implements Im- implementable plans. And I think we find that a lot. Um, you know, if we had all the money in the world, all the mobility in the world, it, you know, it would be a simple matter to enact any goal, any plan, any dream. Uh, but generally... There are, you know, the limits <laughs> that we that we just happen to have. They are what kind of defines how we get are going to go about getting to those goals, um, and they're going to yeah define the nature of how doable some of your plans may or may not be. So first, as we alluded to, the plan must in principle solve some real problem not an imaginary one or not one that you've just made up to make up a problem to sell the solution to people second it must appeal to others often in the face of competing plans or those others will not cooperate and they might well object if i value something therefore i must determine how to value it so that others potentially benefit it can't be just good for me it must be good for me and for the people around me. And even that isn't good enough. Uh, which means that there are even more constraints on how the world must be perceived and acted upon. The manner in which I view and value the world, integrally associated with the plans I'm making, it has to work for me, for my family and for the broader community. And furthermore, it needs to work today in a manner that does not make a worse hash of tomorrow, next week, next month and next year, even the next decade or century. 
there are, thank goodness, an increasingly large number of us that are, that understand that the time that we spend here as consumers on the planet, um, that is no reason for us to act like where there's going to, excuse me, there's no reason for us to consume with no thought for the people that are going to come after us. And, you know, that as far as I can tell, is, you know, thankfully becoming a much more common understanding. Um, people are wanting to be better stewards of the planet. And because of that, you can see the environment as a constraint, population as a constraint, da 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 da, da. Because of that, that is going to help us, you know, that those constraints are going to help steer us in the direction of solving the problems that we have as a planetary society. I believe so anyway, because I believe that humans are really infinitely creative and inventive. Um, you know, I, I, I really think the dinosaurs are dying out, <laughs> so to speak, and... Um, and I've got heaps of faith, you know, in the people that are not only on the planet now, but the people that are being born today and tomorrow, uh, you know, to be the right kinds of people to carry humanity into a future that is more built for us, you know, like we shouldn't have to fit into society. Society should evolve to fit into us, yeah, because we are all society, if that makes sense. Hopefully it does. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, yeah. So a good solution to a problem involving suffering, it must be repeatable without deterioration across repetitions, iterable in a word, across people and across time. And I think that across time one is the hardest because we see many institutions, they start off solving a problem beautifully and being a real boon to society but after a few hundred years they're a little hidebound that you know to have a look at you know I guess education is a good area that you can look at which it um you know because it's become such an institution it now has an interest in its own power and its own power base and keeping its own power therefore it's susceptible to corruption therefore it's not going to deliver the pure reason that it was developed for which is uh you know ed building fine high quality thinking minds uh in 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 our um you know in our people um anyway that's how i'm reading that one anyway so these universal constraints manifest biologically and imposed socially reduce the complexity of the world to something approximating a universally understandable domain of value that is exceptionally important because there are unlimited problems yeah, and there are hypothetically unlimited potential solutions, but there are a comparatively limited number of solutions that work practically, psychologically and socially simultaneously. And, we, you know, we've seen that all the time. How often does, you know, the government or our a business or the people we work for, they come up with, a, you know, some new plan of, you know, being this and doing that or getting that. And it, and it sounds all nice in practice, but when you go to actually try it, then all of a sudden all the problems pop up. Uh, effective solutions, uh, especially when it comes to people, are uh, far harder well, every well, it's always harder to get the solution than it is to pick out the problem. Most most of us are really good at um, pointing out problems, hey, <laughs> and perhaps less good at uh, coming up with solutions to those problems. Um. So yeah, it, it it there are unlimited problems, and there are hypothetically unlimited potential solutions. But there are a comparatively limited number of solutions that can work practically, psychologically and socially all at the same time. 
The fact of limited solutions implies the existence of something like a natural ethic, variable perhaps, as human languages are variable, but still characterised by something solid and universally recognisable at its base. It is the reality of this natural ethic that makes thoughtless denigration of social institutions both wrong and dangerous. Wrong uh, excuse me, wrong and dangerous because those institutions have evolved to solve problems that must be solved for life to continue. They are by no means perfect, but making them better rather than worse is a tricky problem indeed. So I must take the complexity of the world reduce it to a single point so that I can act and take everybody else and their future selves into consideration while I am doing so. How do I manage this? Well, it's not bloody easy. And to me, that's always been about what being truly being an adult is. When you're a kid, you think oh, being an adult means being able to do whatever you want. But what I've come to discover is that you know, truly being adult, not just being a grown-up and somebody of that age, but truly being adult <laughs> is you, you rarely get to indulge and do what you want because most of the time you are doing the what is the right thing to do at that time. It's not a matter of like, ooh, what do I feel like doing now? You know, it's these are the circumstances of my life. This is what's impeding me. These are the obstacles. This is where I'm trying to go. These, This is my ethics. This is what I don't, you know, want to inflict in my pursuit of what I blah, 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 blah. Therefore, I can't act like that, 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 that. Da, 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 da. Like, you see what I mean? Um, you don't, you arrive at the right thing to do rather than just, you know, indulging in your whims and wishes if that makes sense so and that's one of the reasons why I quite relate to Geordie the way Geordie kind of presents that you know the the, the solution the way of uh, finding solutions and the way of working out what do I do next or now so yeah how do I manage this uh, reducing the complexity of the world to a single point so that I can act whilst taking everybody and their future selves into consideration. Well, you manage it by communicating and, the big one, negotiating. Probably one of the pivotal concepts of adulthood is negotiation. By outsourcing the terribly complex cognitive problem to the resources of the broader world. The individuals who compose every society cooperate and compete linguistically, although linguistic interaction by no means exhausts the means of cooperation and competition. It's just one aspect of. Words are formulated collectively and everybody must agree on their use. The verbal framework that helps us delimit the world is a consequence of the landscape of value that is constructed socially, but also bounded by the brute necessity of reality itself. This helps give that landscape shape, and not just any old shape. This is why I think we can collectively agree that, you know, blue is blue and Rome is over there and, you know, that kind of stuff. Because we didn't just make all this stuff up arbitrarily and just decide, agree on it by vote. You know, it has come about with it. There's an additional element that makes things become things, I guess, in our consciousness. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah, this is this helps give that landscape shape and not just any old shape. This is where hierarchies, functional productive hierarchies, not uh, you know the the negative associated hierarchies like social class etc., uh, but just um, uh, discussion, you know, valuation points. So this is where hierarchies, functional, productive hierarchies, more clearly enter the picture. 
things of import must be done or people die or starve or die of thirst or exposure or of loneliness and absence of touch. What needs to be done, it must be specified and planned. The requisite skills for doing so must be developed. That specification, planning and development of skills, as well as the implementation of the informed plan, must be conducted in social space with the cooperation of others and in the face of their competition. In consequence, some will be better at solving the problem at hand and others worse. The variance in ability, as well as the multiplicity of extant problems and the impossibility of training everyone in all skilled domains, necessarily engenders a hierarchical structure, based ideally on genuine competence in relation to the goal. Such a hierarchy, which so that means everybody is working to their strengths. So the hierarchy does not mean that one person is above or below any other person. It's purely a matter of um, suitability. Yeah, and when you are performing at your strengths, and that is your uh, you know biggest and like best contribution that is embiggening to you both socially, psychologically and, you know, for, for want of a better word, spiritually. Uh, excuse me, I just lost my place. So such a hierarchy is, is in its essence, essence, a socially structured tool that must be employed for the effective accomplishment of necessary and worthwhile tasks. He says it a lot better than I just did. <laughs> okay, so such a hierarchy is in its essence a socially structured tool that must be employed for the effective accomplishment of necessary and worthwhile tasks. It is also a social institution that makes progress and peace possible at the same time. Subheading, bottom up. I'll take that. The consensus making up the spoken and unspoken assumptions of worth characterising our societies has an ancient origin, developing over the course of hundreds of millions of years. After all... How should you act is just the short-term, immediate version of the fundamental long-term question, how should you survive? It is therefore instructive to look into the distant past, far down the evolutionary chain, right to the basics, and contemplate the establishment of what is important. The most phylogenetically ancient multicellular organisms, blah, 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 that's far enough for our purposes, tend to be composed of relatively undifferentiated sensory motor cells referenced. These cells map certain facts or features of the environment directly onto the motor output of the same cells. Now remember we went really, really into this uh, in our uh, last book, no, the book before, Spontaneous Evolution. Um, we spent we spent like two, I think it was two whole chapters um, going like right, right into how cells were exactly what elements make up cells, how all the elements work with each other, how the cells get information from their environment, uh, with what mechanisms they use to then um, make a response, etc., etc. So if you... Um, are interested in that go and check out uh, some of the uh, book the nights that we did the book spontaneous evolution um, because we learn a lot about the uh, we learn a lot about um, how the body how matter is made from the cellular level up particularly in the human or the in the um, what is it conscious being 
So yeah, these cells map certain facts or features of the environment directly onto the motor output of the same cells in an essentially one-to-one -one relationship. Stimulus A means response A and nothing else. Once again, that, in, that whole process is broken down and explained really clearly um, in spontaneous evolution. Um, while stimulus B means response B and only response B. Among more differentiated and complex creatures, the larger and commonly recognisable denizens of the natural world, the sensory and motor functions separate and specialise, such that cells undertaking the former functions detect patterns in the world and cells in the latter produce patterns of motor output. This differentiation enables a broader range of patterns to be recognised and mapped, as well as a broader range of action and reaction to be undertaken. So basically we have more cellular input, um, like sensory senses, which so we are more complex beings than beings that have fewer. Um, so we have more different, diff many more different types of di differentiation and m much more specialization of different jobs for the cells, um, for the proteins. So I can't remember which was. I get it all confused. I'm not a genius, Ron. Um, so this differentiation enables a broader range of patterns to be recognized and mapped, as well as a broader range of action and reaction to be undertaken. A third type of cell, neural, emerges sometimes as well, serving as a computational intermediary between the first two. Among species that have adapt, uh, excuse me, among species that have established a neural level of operation, the same pattern of input can produce a different pattern of output, depending, for example, on changes in the animal's environment or internal psychophysical condition. As nervous systems increase in sophistication and more and more layers of neural intermediation emerge, the relationship between simple fact and motor output becomes increasingly complex, unpredictable, and sophisticated. What is putatively the same thing or situation can be perceived in multiple ways. Remember, one planet, many worlds. And two things perceived in the same manner can still give rise to very different behaviours. It is very difficult to constrain even isolated laboratory animals, for example, so thoroughly that they'll behave predictably across trials that have been made as similar as possible. As the layers of neural tissue mediating between, excuse me, as the layers of neural tissue mediating between sensation and action multiply, they also differentiate. Basic motivational systems, often known as drives, appear like hunger, thirst, aggression, etc., adding additional sensory and behavioral specificity and variability. Superseding motivations, in turn, with no clear line of demarcation, are systems of emotion. Cognitive systems emerge much later, first taking form, arguably, as imagination, and later, and only among human beings, only among human beings, as fully-fledged language. Thus, in the most complex of creatures, there is an internal hierarchy of structure, from reflex through drive to language-mediated action, in the particular case of human beings, that must be organised before it can function as a unity and be aimed at a point referenced. How is this hierarchy organised? I think they do go into it a bit in, in spontaneous, in Bruce Lipton's book. So how is this hierarchy organised? A structure that emerged in large part from the bottom up over the vast spans of evolutionary time. We return to the same answer alluded to earlier through the constant cooperation and competition 
the constant jockeying for resources and position, defining the struggle for survival and reproduction. This happens over the unimaginable lengthy spans of time that characterise evolution, as well as the much shorter course of each individual life. Negotiation for position sorts organisms into the omnipresent hierarchies that govern access to vital resources, resources such as shelter, nourishment and mates. Remember, this is all happening on a micro, on the quantum level as well, the same, um, the exact same processes are happening on, on all the different um, levels of uh, the cell. Um, sorry, where are I? <clears throat> All creatures of reasonable complexity and even a minimally social nature have their particular place and know it. All social creatures also learn what is deemed valuable by other group members and derive from that as well as from understanding of their own position a sophisticated, implicit and explicit understanding of value itself. In a phrase, the internal hierarchy that translates facts into actions mirrors the external hierarchy of social organisation. It's another thing spontaneous evolution uh, backs up. It is clear, for example, that chimpanzees in a troop understand their social world and its hierarchical strata at a fine level of detail. They know what's important and who has privileged access to it. They understand such things as if their survival and reproduction depend upon it, as it does. Referenced. Excuse me, I need some water. Oh, sorry if that sounds, um, is really triggering. A newborn infant is equipped with relatively deterministic reflexes, sucking, crying, startling. These nonetheless provide the starting point for the immense range of skills in action that develop with human maturation. By the age of two, and often much earlier than that for many skills, Children can orient with all their senses, walk upright, use their opposable thumb-equipped hands for all sorts of purposes, and communicate their desires and needs both non-verbally and verbally. And this is, of course, just a partial list. This immense array of behavioural abilities is integrated into a complex assortment of emotions and motivational drives, anger, sadness, fear, joy, surprise, and etc., etc., and then organised to fulfil whatever specific, narrow purpose inspires the child for the moment and increasingly over longer spans of time. The developing infant must also hone and perfect the operation of his or her currently dominant motivational state in harmony with all his or her other internal motivational states, as, for example... The separate desire to eat, sleep and play must learn to coexist so that each can manifest itself optimally. And in keeping with the demands, routines and opportunities of the social environment. This honing and perfecting begin with the child's maternal relationship and the spontaneous play behaviour within that circumscribed but still social context. Then, when the child has matured to the point where the internal hierarchy of emotional and motivational functions can be subsumed, even temporarily, as in the child can control themselves, uh, you know, can act appropriately in whatever environment for whatever period of time, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's um, you know, would, would you like a, a sandwich? Yes, please, you know. So, uh, yeah, this honing and perfecting begin within the child's maternal relationship and the spontaneous play behaviour within that circumscribed but still social context. And then, 
when the child's matured to the point where the internal hierarchy of emotional and motivational functions can be subsumed, even temporarily, within a framework provided by a conscious, communicable, abstract goal, i.e. let's play house, or let's eat a sandwich, the child is ready to play with others and to do so over time in an increasingly complex and sophisticated manner. Referenced. Play with others depends, as the great of developmental psychologist Jean Piaget observed, referenced, upon the collective establishment of a shared goal with the child's play partners. Okay, so play with others depends what... I don't know what what depends. Play with others depends upon the collective establishment of a shared goal with the play child's play partners. The collective establishment of a shared goal, i.e. the point of the game, conjoined with rules governing cooperation and competition in relationship to that goal or point, that constitutes a, a true social microcosm. All societies might be regarded as variations upon this play game theme. E pluribus unum, out of one comes many. Oh, sorry, out of many, one. Oh, sorry, I've got that so backwards. Out of many comes one, <laughs> not the other way around. <laughs> that's the, um, that's the, oh, the song lyric. Oh, goodness me. <coughs> yeah, e pluribus many, uh, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And in all functional and decent societies, the basic rules of fair play, predicated on reciprocity across situation and time, come inevitably to apply. Games, like solutions to problems, must be iterable to endure, and there are principles that apply to and undergird what constitutes the iterability. Piaget suspected, for example, that games undertaken voluntarily will outcompete games imposed and played under the threat of force, given that some of the energy that could be expended on the game itself, whatever the nature, has to be wasted on the enforcement. And yeah, of course, spontaneous play is always way more fun. It's even, um, even in adult form, uh, take the difference between when you rehearse for a play or a stage show opposed to when you're doing uh, like improvisational uh, theatre or theatre sports and stuff like that, or improv uh, comedy. Uh, same setting, same kind of, uh, you know, principles apply, but completely different uh, vibe, completely different energy, completely different value system. And, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, different, I guess, different hierarchical structure <laughs> structures. Um, so yes, uh, there is evidence indicating the emergence of such voluntary game-like arrangements, even among our non-human kin. Referenced. The universal rules of fair play include the ability to regulate emotion and motivation while cooperating and competing in pursuit of the goal during the game, that's part and parcel of being able to play at all, as well as the ability and will to establish res, res, excuse me, as well as the ability and will to establish reciprocally beneficial interactions across time and and situation, as we already discussed. That's another five-line long sentence, Geordie, you wordy bugger. And life is not simply a game, but a series of games, each of which has something in common, whatever defines a game, and something unique, or there'd be no reason for multiple games. At minimum, there is a starting point. Kindergarten, a zero zero score, a first date, an entry level job, etc., and that needs to be improved upon, a procedure for enacting that improvement, and a desirable goal graduation from high school, a winning score, a permanent romantic relationship, a prestigious career, etc., etc. Because of that commonality, there is an ethic, or more properly, a meta ethic. 
that emerges from the bottom up across the set of all games. The best player is therefore not the winner of any given game, but, among many other things, he or she who is invited by the largest number of others to play the most extensive series of games. It is for this reason, which you may not understand explicitly at the time, that you tell your children it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. How should you play to be that most desirable of players? What structure must take form within you so that such a play is possible? And those two questions are interrelated because the structure that will enable you to play properly and with increasing and automated or habitual precision will emerge only in the process of continually practicing the art of playing properly. Where might you learn how to play? Everywhere if you're fortunate and awake. Subheading. The utility of the fool. Oh, okay, so cool. Now we're going to get in. I wondered why he used the um, the fool card at the start of this chapter. I like um, working out what the associations of, um, you know, he's always got an image at the start of his, of each rule, even in the, in the last book. And I like kind of discovering how it plays into what he's writing about. Because most of the um, front chapter pieces I've known, some of them I haven't. Some of them have been either sculptures or art pieces that I was unfamiliar with. But many of them I did know. So it was, it was um, uh, cool to see them in that context. So the utility of the fool. It's useful to take your place at the bottom of a hierarchy. I agree. Not forever. <laughs> but it is useful. You learn a lot. It can aid in the development of gratitude and humility. Gratitude. There are people whose expertise exceeds your own. And you should be wisely pleased about that. Oh yes. Oh yes, I really, really am. Always have been. Always will be. There are many valuable niches to fill, given the many serious and complex problems that we must solve. The fact that there are people who fill these niches with trustworthy skill and experience is something for which to be truly thankful. I agree. Humility. It is better to presume ignorance and invite learning than to assume sufficient knowledge and risk the consequent blindness. It is, I, I, I can't always live up to that, but that, that is the principle that I do uh, try to live up to. My, my ego does occasionally get the better of me. It's much better to make friends with what you do not know than with what you do know, as there is an infinite supply of the former, <laughs> but a finite stock of the latter. <laughs> yeah, in case you don't know what you don't know, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> When you're tightly boxed in or cornered, all too often by your own stubborn and fixed adherence to some unconsciously worshipped assumptions, all there is to help you is what you've not yet learned. Fucking sounds pretty bloody obvious when you put it that way, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it really does. I mean, like, that's like, you know, slap in the face with a wet fish. When you're tightly boxed in or cornered, all too often by your own stubborn and fixed adherence to some unconsciously worshipped assumptions, all there is to help you is what you have not yet learned. It is necessary and helpful to be, and in some ways to remain, a beginner. For this reason, the tarot deck, beloved by intuitives, romantics, fortune tellers and scoundrels alike, contains within it the fool as a positive card, an illustrated variant of which opens this chapter. The fool is a young, handsome man, eyes lifted upward, journeying in the mountains, sun shining brightly upon him, aboutly, about to carelessly step over a cliff. 
or is he? His strength, however, is precisely his willingness to risk such a drop, to risk being once again at the bottom. No one unwilling to be a foolish beginner can learn. It was for this reason, among others, that Carl Jung regarded the fool as the archetypal precursor to the figure of the equally archetypal redeemer, the perfected individual. The beginner, the fool, is continually required to be patient and tolerant with himself and equally with others. His displays of ignorance, inexperience and lack of skill may still sometimes be rightly attributed to irresponsibility and condemned justly by others, but the insufficiency of the fool is often better regarded as an inevitable consequence of each individual's essential vulnerability, rather than as a true moral failing. It is what it is. It's not a bad thing. It's not a male. We are of necessity ignorant to most things. Much that is great starts small, ignorant, and useless. This lesson permeates popular as well as classical or traditional culture. Consider, for example, the Disney heroes Pinocchio and Simba, as well as J.K. Rowling's magical Harry Potter. Pinocchio begins as a wooden-headed marionette, the puppet of everyone's decisions but his own. The Lion King has his origin as a naive cub, the the unwitting pawn of a treacherous and malevolent uncle. The student of wizarding is an unloved orphan, with a dusty cupboard for a bedroom in Voldemort, who might as well be Satan himself, for his arch enemy. <coughs> Great mythologized heroes often come into the world, likewise, in the most meagre of circumstances, as the child of an Israelite slave, for example, or a newborn in a lowly manger, and in great danger. Consider the Pharaoh's decision to slay all the firstborn male babies of the Israelites and Herod's comparable edict much later. But today's beginner is tomorrow's master. Thus, it is necessary even for the most accomplished, but who wishes to accomplish still more, to retain identification with as the as yet unsuccessful, to appreciate the striving towards competence, to carefully and with true humility subordinate him or herself to the current game and to develop the knowledge, self-control and discipline necessary to make the next move. I visited a restaurant in Toronto with my wife, son and daughter while writing this. As I made my way to my party's table, a young waiter asked if he might say a few words to me. He told me that he'd been watching my videos, listening to my podcasts and reading my book and that he had, in consequence, changed his attitude towards his comparatively lower status but still useful and necessary job. He'd ceased criticising what he was doing or himself for doing it, deciding instead to be grateful and seek out whatever opportunities presented themselves right there before him. He made up his mind to become more diligent and reliable and to see what would happen if he worked as hard as he could. He told me, with an uncontrived smile, he'd been promoted three times in six months. The young man had come to realise that every place he might find himself in had more potential than he might first see, particularly when his vision was impaired by the resentment and cynicism he felt from being near the bottom. After all, it's not as if a restaurant is a simple place. And this was part of an extensive national organisation, a large, high-quality chain. To do a good job in such a place, servers must get along with the cooks, who are, by universal recognition, a formidably troublesome and tricky lot. They must also be polite and engaging with customers. They have to pay attention constantly. They must adjust to highly varying workloads, the rushes and dead times that inevitably accompany the life of a server. 
They have to show up on time, sober and awake. They must treat their superiors with the proper respect or and do the same for those, such as the dishwashers, below them in the structure of authority. And if they do all these things and happen to be working in a functional institution, also key, they will soon render themselves difficult to replace. Customers, colleagues and superiors alike will begin to react to them in an increasingly positive manner. Doors that would otherwise remain closed to them, even invisible, will be opened. And furthermore, the skills they acquire will prove eminently portable. That is one thing I have learned in my many, 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 many careers across many, many, many wide and varying industries. All your skills are portable in some way, shape or form. So, yeah, they, your skills they acquire will remain eminently portable, whether, whether they continue to rise in the hierarchy of restaurateurs or decide instead to further their education or change their career tra- trajectory completely, in which case they will leave with laudatory praise from their previous employers and vastly increased chances of discovering their next opportunity. As might be expected... A young man who had something to say to me, the the young man who had something to say to me, was thrilled with what had happened to him. His status concerns had been solidly and realistically addressed by his rapid career advance, and the additional money he was making didn't hurt either. He had accepted, and therefore transcended, tiny, a few words, really important concept. He had accepted and therefore transcended his role as a beginner. He had ceased being casually cynical about the place he occupied in the world and the people who surrounded him and accepted the structure and the position he was offered. He started to see possibility and opportunity where before he was blinded, essentially, by his own pride. He stopped denigrating the social institution he found himself part of and began to play his part properly. And that increment in humility paid off in spades. All right, we're nearly nearly done. We'll see how long this little section is. Okay, a couple more pages and we'll call it for the evening. Just let me wash my whistle. Subheading. The necessity of equals. It is good to be a beginner, but it is good to be... Excuse me. But it is good of a different sort to be an equal among equals. It is said with much truth that genuine communication can only take place between peers. This is because it is very difficult to move information up a hierarchy, something that the mainstream struggles to understand. This is because it is very difficult to move information up a hierarchy. Those well positioned, and this is a great danger of moving up, have used their current competence, their cherished opinions, their present knowledge, their current skills, to stake a moral claim to their status. In consequence, they have little motivation to admit to error, to learn or change, and plenty of reason not to. If a subordinate exposes the ignorance of someone with greater status, he risks humiliating that person questioning the validity of the latter's claim to influence and status and revealing him as incompetent, outdated, or false. For this reason, it is very wise to approach your boss, for example, carefully carefully and privately with a problem, and perhaps best to also have a solution at hand, and not one proffered too incautiously. Barriers exist to the flow of genuine information down a hierarchy as well. 
For example, the resentment people lower in the chain of command might feel about their hypothetically lesser position can make them loathe to act productively on information from above or, in the worst case, can motivate them to work at counter-purposes to what they've learned out of sheer spite. In addition, those who are inexperienced or less educated or who newly occupy a subordinate position and therefore lack knowledge of their surroundings can be more easily influenced by a relative position in the exercise of power instead of quality of argumentation and observation of competence. Peers, by contrast, must in the main be convinced. Their attention must be carefully reciprocated. To be surrounded by peers is to exist in a state of equality and to manifest the give and take necessary to maintain that equality. It's therefore good to be in the middle of a hierarchy. (laughs) This is partly why friendships are so important and why they form so early in life. A two-year-old typically is self-centred, although also capable of simple reciprocal actions. The same Scarlet, who I talked about earlier, my granddaughter, the the pointer from uh, not last time, uh, from uh, Friday night, uh, my granddaughter would happily hand me one of her favourite stuffed toys attached to a pacifier when I asked her to, and then I would hand it or toss it back. Sometimes she'd toss it to me too, or at least relatively near me. She loved this game. We played it with a spoon as well, an implement she was just beginning to master. She played the same way with her mother and her grandmother, with anyone who happened to be within playing distance, if she was familiar with them enough not to be shy. This was the beginning of behaviours that transformed themselves into fully-fledged sharing amongst older children because you can see the you know how the behavior evolves into more complex behavior but still kind of all part of the same um you know the same category my daughter Michaela Scarlett's mother took her child to the outdoor recreational space on top of their downtown condo a few days before I wrote this A number of other children were playing there, most of them older, and there were plenty of toys. Scarlett spent her time hoarding as many of the playthings as possible near her mother's chair and was distinctly unimpressed if other children came along to purloin one for themselves. She even took a ball directly from another child to add to her collection. This is typical behaviour for children two and younger, Their ability to reciprocate, while hardly absent and able to manifest itself in truly endearing ways, is developmentally limited. By three years of age, however, most children are capable of truly sharing. They can delay gratification long enough to take their turn while playing a game that everyone cannot play simultaneously. They can begin to understand the point of a game played by several people and follow the rules, although they may not be able to give a coherent verbal account of what those rules are. They start to form friendships upon repeated exposure to children with whom they have successfully negotiated reciprocal play relationships. Some of these friendships turn into the first intense relationships that children have outside their family. It is in the context of such relationships which tend strongly to form between equals in age, or at least equals in developmental age, that a child learns to bond tightly to a peer and starts to learn how to treat another person properly while requiring the same in return. This mutual bonding is vitally important. A child without at least one friend, one special close friend, is much more likely to suffer later psychological problems, whether of the depressive anxious or antisocial sort referenced. While children with fewer friends are also more likely to be unemployed and unmarried as adults referenced. There is no evidence that the importance of friendship declines in any manner with age. All causes of mortality 
appear to be reduced among adults with high quality social networks, even when general health status is taken into consideration. And that, that is, is true. There's something that, um, because of my mum, uh, you know, my mum's a bit of a nerd and, um, you know, she's 20 years older than me. Um, but something I, I learned because of her is that, um, you know, the, the more healthily and active and fulfilling your social life is, um, yeah, the more, uh, the health, the healthier and longer lived you will intend to be. And also during that time, your quality, you'll perceive your quality of life as being high, relatively higher as well. Um... So yeah, all causes of mortality appear to be reduced among adults with highly high quality social networks, even when general health status is taken into consideration. This remains true among the elderly in the case of diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, emphysema and arthritis, and for younger and older adults alike in the case of heart attacks. Interestingly enough, there is some evidence that it is the precision, pre, excuse me, interestingly enough, there is some evidence that it is the provision of social support as much or more than its receipt that provides these protective benefits. Right. So it's both sides of the contract are equally, if not more, for when you... Um, give the socialing than receiving. So that's that is interesting. Interestingly enough, uh, there is some evidence that is th that it is the provision of social support. So being somebody's friend, being someone's mentor, being somebody's uh, I don't know support person, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That provides, uh, excuse me, as um, as much or more than its receive than its receipt that provides these protective benefits, and somewhat unsurprisingly, that those who give more tend to receive more. Referenced, thus, it truly seems that it is better to give than to receive. Peers distribute both the burdens and the joys of life. Recently, when my wife Tammy and I suffered serious health problems, we were fortunate enough to have family members, my in-law's sister and brother, my own mother, sister, our children, and close friends stay with us and help for substantial periods of time. You know, I, I'm a big believer in community, you know, I really am. The nuclear family is an abomination, I really believe it. Uh, so, yeah, they were willing to put their own lives on hold to aid us while we were in crisis. Before that, when my book 12 Rules for Life became a success and during the extensive speaking tour that followed, Tammy and I were close to people with whom we could share our good fortune. These were friends and family members genuinely pleased with what was happening and following the events of our lives avidly and who were willing to discuss what could have been the overwhelming public response. This greatly heightened the significance and meaning of everything we were doing and reduced the isolation such that a dramatic shift in life circumstances, for better or worse, is likely to produce. The relationships established with colleagues of similar status at work constitute another important source of peer regulation in addition to friendship. To maintain good relationships with your colleagues means, among other things, to give credit where credit is due, to take your fair share of the jobs nobody wants but still must be done, to deliver on time and in a high quality manner when teamed with other people, to show up when expected and, in general, to be trusted to do somewhat more than your job formally requires. The approval or disapproval of your colleagues rewards and enforces this continued reciprocity and that, like the reciprocity that's necessarily a part of friendship, helps maintain stable psychological function. It's much better 
to be somebody who can be relied upon, not least so that during times of personal trouble, the people you've worked beside are willing to step in and help. Through friendship and collegial relationships, we modify our selfish proclivities, learning not to always put ourselves first. Less obviously, but just as importantly, we may also learn to overcome our naive and too empathic proclivities, our tendency to sacrifice unsuitably and unjustly to predatory others, when our peers advise and encourage us to stand up for ourselves. In consequence, if we're fortunate, we begin to practice true reciprocity and we gain at least some of the advantage spoken about so famously by the poet Robert Burns. Quote, Oh goodness, I'll do my best here. Oh what some power to gift to give us, to see ourselves as it see us. It weighed for a money a blunder free us, and foolish notion, what airs in dress and gateway lay us, and even devotion. <laughs> Referenced. And I believe that is actually where we will leave it for the evening. <laughs> I am unfamiliar um, with the work of Robert Burns. Not unfamiliar with the name, but obviously he writes in an accent. <laughs> um, I'll try to write the lyrics down and put it in the com in the comment section. But yeah, we're going to leave it there for the uh, the evening, and we'll pick it up about eight thirty uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time tomorrow um, with the subheading "Top Dog." And um, yeah, so yeah, that was kind of. Oh, I like I liked that little bit. That kind of was quite far ranging. It was a little bit. I I thought last night I was like, oh, he started off a little bit wobbly, you know, because he wrote a lot of this when he was very ill and when really hectic things were happening to him and his family. Um, but yeah, that was some pretty tight kind of stuff. I, I'm a little bit. I I'm I'm not as sold on. I don't have as much faith in the institutions as he does. Quite honestly, I, you know, I can't buy in I, I guess he's a product of the institutions he's been you know pretty high up in his university for quite a long time so obviously he's privy to information that I'm not privy to and, and to be able to see a side of you know those kinds of it, um, institutions that I'm not uh, I've been a teacher in a high school but not in a university but I've been to university <laughs> After I trained as a teacher too, so you know, yeah, I'm not sure if yeah, I just don't think I'm not sure if I have the same kind of level of trust in them, especially nowadays. You know, there, my university education was a great dis my university experience was a great disappointment to me. I'd spent my whole life, you know, like really, really looking forward to tertiary education. I really believed in it. And, um, yeah, it was quite a letdown. But anyway, come and hang out with me tomorrow uh, if you feel like it. Uh, and thanks for hanging out with me this evening or for catching the replay if that's what you're doing. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. So I'm streaming here with um, the book reading stuff, 8.30 every night uh, from Sunday nights through to Friday nights. So I have Saturdays off. And I think that's about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go now. <laughs> Let me find my mouse. All right, no, I really appreciate you coming and hanging out. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll see you all tomorrow. Oh, yeah, my name's Creatrix Zebedee. Welcome to my channel and all that. If you liked it, consider subscribing or just like the video or... or don't that's totally okay i'm really glad you just watched anyway thanks bye